As any good fan of the history guy knows, all good stories involve pirates, those dangerous rogues who plied their evil trade across the seven seas. But what exactly are the seven seas? The term actually well predates the golden age of piracy, and like many things in history, the answer might not quite be what you expect. It is history that deserves to be remembered. These are not necessarily easily definable bodies. Merriam-Webster has several definitions, including a great body of salt water that covers most of the earth, as well as a body of salt water of second rank, more or less landlocked. The United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea defines all of the ocean as sea. Thus, anyone in the Atlantic can said to be at sea, even if they aren't on a body of water called a sea. Usually a sea is salt water, but the Sea of Galilee is a freshwater lake, and the Caspian and Aral Seas have also been referred to as large lakes. As definable sections of the ocean, marginal seas are usually mostly separated from the ocean by land, like the Mediterranean, Red and Black Sea, but that definition also includes bodies of water not generally called seas, such as the Gulf of Mexico and the Hudson Bay. There is no strict definition. Various bodies of water are called seas, from the Philippine Sea and the Coral Sea to the current-bound Sargasso Sea, the landlocked Caspian Sea, the not-quite-separate Red Sea, or the Mediterranean Sea, itself made up of various smaller seas, such as the Aegean and the Adriatic Seas. By any definition, there are clearly more than seven seas on any modern map. The earliest known reference to the Seven Seas dates to a hymn from the ancient Sumerians, dated to around 2300 BC. Among the earliest poets to have their name recorded to history, Inhejuana wrote to a Sumerian moon deity, O house, your shining face is the great snake of the reed marsh, your foundation, O shrine, the fifty abzus, the seven seas, has plumbed the inner workings of your prince. The matter of what precisely the poet meant by these terms is not exactly clear as much as the context has been lost. Abzu means something like deep waters, likely fresh waters, while the seven seas may refer instead to salt waters. Whether they referred to some kind of metaphorical seas or actual seas is not certain. The Greeks may have taken the idiom from early Mesopotamian cultures, although the exact route is impossible to determine. What is certain is that the Greeks had their own version of the seven seas, this relating to their own seafaring knowledge. According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the seven Greek seas were the Aegean, Adriatic, Mediterranean, Black, Red, and Caspian seas, along with the Persian Gulf. But there were other seas known to the Greeks as well, such as the Tyrrhenian Sea and the Ionian Sea, and sometimes their lists differed. Confusing things further, Roman historian Pliny the Elder, writing in the first century, defined the seas completely differently. The Po River, the longest river in Italy, discharges into a series of salt marshes on the coast of the Adriatic Sea, separated by sandbars from the main body of water. All those rivers and trenches were first made by the Etruscans, thus discharging the flow of the river across the marshes of the Etriani, called the Seven Seas, or Septum Maria. These were bodies of water that had to be crossed to reach Venice, which is likely part of the reason why historian Frederick Chapin Lane says the expression to sail the Seven Seas was applied to the Venetians long before they sailed the oceans. The ancient Persians took a similar route when they identified their Seven Seas to mean various major rivers in Central Asia. In Judaism, the Babylonian Talmud refers to its own set of seven seas and four rivers which surround Israel. The seas of Tiberias, Sodom, Hiltha, Sibke, Aspamia, and the Great Sea, which corresponds to the Sea of Galilee, the Dead Sea, the Red Sea, Lake Ram, Lake Hula, and the Mediterranean, although the Sea of Aspamia does not seem to exist today. Ancient Arabs also had their own list of seven seas, these being the seas they traveled through in trade routes when they went east. In the ninth century, an Arab author wrote that whoever wants to go to China must cross seven seas, each one with its own color and wind and fish and breeze, completely unlike the sea that lies beside it. The seas corresponding to the modern Persian Gulf, the Arabian Sea, the Bay of Bengal, the Strait of Malacca, the Singapore Strait, the Gulf of Thailand, and the South China Sea. These seas were referred to often in Arabian literature, although they were not necessarily the only bodies of water that Arabs called seas. In fact, the term seven seas was not limited to Europe and the Middle East, but was used by other cultures as well. In Hinduism, when the world was created, it was made with seven continents, are surrounded severally by seven great seas. 
Unlike the seas of other cultures, the Hindu seas were legendary, included seas of salt water, sugarcane juice, wine, clarified butter, curds, milk, and fresh water. Some versions have slightly different lists, but there are always seven bodies in Hindu cosmology. According to the 1928 Nuggets of Knowledge by George Stimson, the seven seas are referred to in the literature of the ancient Hindus, Chinese, Persians, Romans, and other nations. For him, the Hindus applied the name to bodies of water in the Punjab. China actually presents a different theory of the seas, however, and an ancient name for China is the land between four seas, representing a metaphorical boundary for Chinese territory. Each of those seas represents a compass direction, and the easiest to identify are the East China Sea to the east and the South China Sea to the south, while the other two were metaphorical but eventually identified with Lake Baikal in the north and various lakes to the west, like Lake Singhai and Lake Balkash, or even possibly the, the Persian Gulf. As exploration and understanding grew and changed, so did the definition of seven seas. In Europe, the Middle Ages saw various definitions that, of course, differed from the original Greek seas from which they borrowed the term and grew to include some lists like the Atlantic Ocean, the Arabian Sea, the Baltic Sea, and the North Sea, in addition to the Black Mediterranean Red Seas, and decisions over whether seas like the Adriatic counted were far from decided. The age of exploration further complicated any simple definition, with some early modern writers choosing the Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean, Indian Ocean, Arctic Ocean, and throwing in the Mediterranean and Caribbean Sea along with the Gulf of Mexico. The logic of such definitions quickly falls apart with much scrutiny, but nonetheless writers would attempt to fit new knowledge into the schema of the ancient idiom. British colonial tea clippers could claim to cross seven seas on their routes from China to England through the Banda Sea, the Celebs Sea, the Java Sea, South China Sea, Sulu Sea, and the Timor Sea. In any and all of the above definitions throughout time, the term seven seas could be read less literally and more in common usage to simply mean many seas or all the seas. A captain who had sailed the seven seas may never have been expected to name what those seas were, but simply be understood to be an expert sailor who had sailed to faraway islands. The number seven has traditionally been considered lucky or sacred in many cultures, reflected in famous sevens like the seven wonders of the world. The medieval understanding of seven liberal arts, seven days in a week, seven sins, and seven heavenly bodies, being the planets plus the sun and the moon, which were easy to see with the naked eye in antiquity. Ancient Egypt had seven paths to heaven, and Osiris traveled through seven halls in the underworld, and the Sumerians had seven domes that made up the heavens. In many parts of the world, cats have seven lives, not nine, and in Hippocratic medicine, the number seven rules illnesses of the body. The number seven is considered more pervasive than that, and covers everything from seven layers of purgatory to the seven voyages of Sinbad, another old story telling of journeys on the so-called seven seas. As the early modern era turned modern, curious people the world over wondered what the seven seas were, and ask anyone who would listen. The term was especially popularized following the publication of Rudyard Kipling's 1896 collection of poems, The Seven Seas. That work led to hundreds of questions wondering what exactly those seven seas everyone had heard so much about were. The Seven Seas magazine in 1915 wrote directly to Kipling, asking him where he had taken the name. Kipling thought that the expression was a very old one and traced it to the work of Omar Khayyam, a 10th century Persian poet and polymath, from a 19th century English translation. Another reader suggests the name came from a Hawaiian song written down in the 1820s by British missionary William Ellis, which talks of the eight seas, the channels which separate the Hawaiian islands. Various other experts and trivia collectors sought to answer the question as well. In a 1930 edition of the Aspen Times, a writer listed several sets of seven seas. His list of Greek seas included the Tyrrhenian, Ionian, and Sarduum seas west of Sardinia. He also lists seven seas east of the Suez, the Caspian, Aral, Akosk, Japan, China, and Arabian, and Red Seas. In Polynesia, he lists seven more, and in the Western Hemisphere includes the Bering Sea, Beaufort Sea, Greenland Sea, Lincoln Sea, Baffin Sea, Caribbean Sea, and the Yucatan Channel. His sources are unknown. In 1921, the Pittsburgh Daily Post cites the Roman tale of the seven seas near Venice. Another writer simply threw up their hand saying, I do not believe Kipling or anyone else knows what he meant by the term. A later invention declares there are five oceans and seven seas. The original isn't clear except that it combines the modern understanding of five oceans with the ancient idiom. And what those seven seas are isn't any more clear. 
As for how the term became so closely associated with pirates, that's even less clear. The phrase doesn't appear in Treasure Island, nor a general history of the pirates of 1724, but by 1953, the movie Raiders of the Seven Seas put the term firmly among pirates. The most likely connection seems simply to be that pirates quickly turned to legends, and they were already deeply associated with the sea. Only the most experienced pirates could have traveled so far as to see all seven, whatever seas those might have been. Today, people still wonder about the names of the seven seas, and the answer that it depends might not always be satisfying. Seems the idiom has outlived its original purpose, except I guess that it's always meant a lot of water. In fact, modern definitions take a lot of fun out of it. There are dozens of bodies of water that are now called seas, and dozens more that could be by various definitions. A modern Seven Seas often refers to no sea at all. In the 1957 book of the Seven Seas, author Peter Fritchen says that everybody talks about the Seven Seas, but hardly anyone can name them. It is a very old phrase, and a very new one too. And in between, no one tried to count. He goes on to give a modern definition that separates the Atlantic and the Pacific into northern and southern sections in addition to the Indian, Arctic, and southern oceans, and that's probably a list that most of us can agree on if you insist on being literal. But no matter what definition you use, and no matter what period in history you lived, it is still impressive to be able to claim that you have sailed the seven seas. And I'll be true to any man as long as he's ashore. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you have to do is subscribe.